Good day, one and all. I have something a little bit different and unique to show you today. What you're looking at here is an Accutronics Spring Reverb. Ooh, made in the USA, that's pretty cool. That's the model right there. And uh, what you do with this thing is it's got two RCA jacks on it, in and out. And you put an audio signal, whatever you want, into this input jack. And then you connect your, well, your output to the output jack. And it's a reverb. It adds reverb to whatever sound um, that you're putting through it. And of course, you know, you've got, you know, MP3 players and some digital recorders like my Olympus LS7 that let you add reverb digitally to whatever you're listening to. And you might have seen um, reverb units, ones made, for example, by Realistic, where you plug them into the wall, they're electronic, they're electrically powered, and uh, they're stereo, and you put a stereo signal into them, and you can add reverb to your stereo setup if you want to. So alright, that's if that's all this thing does, well that's not a very interesting video, is it? Well here's the thing, this thing's a little bit different than either of those solutions I just mentioned. Because if we look at the underside... Ooh, now we're talking. This is a spring reverb, it's got actual springs in it. Well how the heck does this work? Well, if you look right here, there's your input jack. And your sound, your input sound, travels into this little coil. And this coil actually has a laminated core inside it. So when your sound runs through this little coil, and it travels magnetically, electromagnetically, through the laminated core, right inside there, where the springs attach, let me see if I can get up close here, the springs are attached to tiny little magnets that are hinged. So when the sound runs through the coil, runs through the uh, lamination, and it magnetically couples with those tiny hinged magnets, the magnets move, which causes this end of the spring to move. And this happens on like almost a microscopic level. The springs move very, very little. It's a very fine vibration. And so the little magnets move because of the magnetic coupling and it causes the spring to move. Well the motion is picked up over on this end so there's little magnets over here as well that the, sprinkers, that the springs are anchored to. And when this end of the spring moves it moves a magnet which creates uh, an elect uh, magnetic field in this lamination which gets picked up by this coil and then travels to your output jack as sound. So this end's doing the opposite of what this end does. This end takes in sound to create magnetic force to move the springs and then this end uses motion to create a magnetic field um, which travels over the output jack. And how the reverb, of course, works is because, you know, it, it's an electromechanical device. So because these springs move and because the springs are quite long, there's a certain resonance in the spring. So when an electromechanical representation of the sound goes through the springs, some of that sound reflects back and forth and that's what causes your reverb. I'm not very good at explaining it, but that's basically how it works. And um, it, it works for sure. Now, unfortunately, I can't demonstrate this to you because you need an amplifier on the output side. Um, this outputs, obviously, because it's not electrically powered or anything, this outputs an extremely weak signal, and you need an amplifier to be able to hear anything. I've tried some things that I thought might have been good enough. Um, I tried using the uh, line input on my tape deck, uh, the microphone input even, Nothing works. It has to be really strongly amplified in order to work, and I don't have anything that can do that. I used to own an amp. I don't anymore. But So I can't demonstrate you as is, but you can imagine what reverb would sound like, and there's lots of other videos on YouTube demonstrating these. But what I can demonstrate to you is sort of an, an Easter egg, if you will, that you can do with these spring reverbs. 
Now here's the thing, obviously sitting here um, I can physically manipulate the springs like that and as it turns out physically manipulating the springs like this creates an extremely you know relatively very strong signal on the output and it as it turns out when you manipulate these springs like this you create some tremendous unintended sounds like crashing sounds and really loud springy springy sounds and th there's just a sort of a multitude of sounds although for the most part uh, the best general explanation is just like a thundering crashing sound that you get when the springs vibrate very uh, at very high amplitude like this and um, that's very very cool now a spring reverb unit like this uh, this isn't something that you'd buy off the shelf obviously this is something that would have been built into something else sometimes you can buy guitar amplifiers that have a spring reverb unit like this one um, built into them and people have found much to their um, surprise um, if they have the reverb activated on their guitar amplifier and they pick up the guitar amplifier to move it that motion of picking up the amplifier and putting it down causes that motion in the spring and all of a sudden they get this super loud crashing sound that scares the crap out of them and they wonder what just exploded inside their guitar amplifier but um, yeah, it's it's pretty funny. Absolutely unintended, um, but it as it turns out, it's a really cool effect. And actually, there have been musicians that use um, this unintended effect of a spring reverb um, in their performance in in their music. Um, one that I can tell you about is near that's near and dear to me as well as some of you know. Um, I'm a big fan of Emerson, Lake and Palmer prog rock group in the 1970s. They formed in 1970. Um, basically disbanded in 1977. They were forced to make one more album to fulfill a deal that was released in 1978. Uh, that album was crap. Most ELP fans, including myself, pretend it doesn't exist. Uh, reformed in the early 90s. Toured the world for a few years. Um, sort of split up again in the late 90s and got back together a few times throughout the 2000s just for sort of one-off performances and the last gig they played together was in 2010 um, the name of the festival or show that they performed in escapes me um, but they played very poorly they were all out of practice and it wasn't a very good performance and that was the last time they ever performed in 2010 uh, they went their separate ways they all kept playing um, sort of doing their own thing. Um, about a year and a half ago, Keith Emerson took a gun and shot himself in the head, um, which was definitely very sad. And then uh, Greg Lake, uh, who is the bassist, uh, died of cancer earlier this year. Um, the drummer, Carl Palmer, he's alive and well, very fit and healthy in his late 60s. And he performs, he keeps playing regularly, he plays in a band called ELP Legacy, which is sort of a, a tribute band for ELP. But anyway, what I'm getting at with that is that Keith Emerson, the keyboardist, he had three main instruments that he always played. He played the piano, obviously, um, and he composed piano music, actually, and he, he was a very excellent composer. He was just as excellent of a composer as he was um, a player. Um, the other two instruments bit more interesting that he played were the Moog synthesizer and the Hammond organ. Uh, mostly the Hammond organ in his early stuff and then the Moog synthesizer in his later stuff and then near the end mid to late 70s he adopted a Yamaha GX1 synthesizer. So anyway, um, Hammond organs actually have, um, at least the old ones anyway, um, they have a spring reverb built into them. The spring reverb was actually invented by Lawrence Hammond in the 1940s, I think. And he started building it um, into Hammond organs and you could turn the reverb on or off, whatever you wanted. And so Keith Emerson um, would take advantage of the spring reverb in his Hammond organ, like what I've mentioned, 
Um, he generally had, well, I, I don't know if he had more, but I know of two Hammond organs that Keith Emerson used, and he often used them both. Um, at the same time when he was playing. Uh, one was a Hammond B3, um, very ubiquitous organ, very large, often used in churches. But the other organ he used was a Hammond L100, which was a very cheap home model. And the L100 is sort of the more well-known of the ones that he used because that was the one he abused um, in his performances. He used to do some crazy stuff with his Hammond L100 organ. Uh, I, I can't even begin to explain, but um, one of the things he often did with his Hammond L100 was um, abuse the spring reverb to get this, you know, crashing sound in the music that he played, and it's very, very cool to me anyway. Um, but yeah, uh, he'd physically move the organ, uh, you know, pick it up and then drop it on the floor and you'd get this loud crashing sound. Um, sometimes he would actually physically manipulate the springs by hand, reach behind the organ, uh, you know, in a Hammond organ, at least in the L100, the spring reverbs like this with the open side facing towards the back, and the back of the organ is open, and so it's very easy to just reach in there and play with the springs. And so that's what he did sometimes. But yeah, very, very cool stuff. So while I can't demonstrate this thing with music running through it, I can actually demonstrate this um, sort of Easter egg you get with these because abusing the spring reverb like this you get a very loud signal that can be picked up by just about anything so how this is gonna work is I have my Olympus LS7 audio recorder and I've got this RCA to 3.5 millimeter jack so that can go in the microphone port like that and then we've got stereo jacks here, but I just need one. Then I'm going to plug in the output. And there it is, plugged into the output. And that's all we need. Um, I'm just going to turn this thing on and set it to record. And um, yeah, let's, um, let's play with this thing and I'll show you what sort of crazy sounds you can make with this. So yeah, as you can see, um, pretty neat, fun little thing, things you can do with something like this. The construction of this is kind of interesting. Um, you can see the spring assembly here and this sled that the springs are attached to is itself suspended by springs. So this thing is dampened in all three dimensions and that helps suppress the unintended motion of the springs um, like I just demonstrated there. So like if I push this sled down so it's tight against the casing of the thing and I um, fling the springs here you can see they go and go and go and go and that's obviously um, very unintended behavior. But by being suspended by springs I do this and they quiet down a little bit quicker. But uh, yeah, I thought I'd just make a little video just showing what this is and how you can sort of play around with it. It's a pretty neat device um, with a pretty neat history and um, if you ever come across one you can do some pretty wild stuff with it. 
or use it as is if you want. Um, if you have a guitar amp of Alt 1, you could, you know, you could mod this into it and uh, then you have a spring reverb to play around with. But yeah, I just thought it was pretty neat. I uh, found this in a lounge at school, thought I'd borrow it to uh, make this video and then I'm going to bring it back. So there you go. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you later. Mm -hmm.